All right. Very good. So thank you for coming. I hope you enjoyed the first panel on uh, cryptocurrencies for Africa, uh, a single cryptocurrency for Africa. Now for the second panel, we're going to talk about uh, blockchain technologies. So we have already covered uh, the aspect of uh, uh, virtual uh, or cryptocurrencies, which will try to stay away. Um, uh, the other aspects of uh, blockchain technologies and we'll try to get into more practical uses and uh, show some uh, uh, concrete examples. So on this panel here, we have, uh, first of all, starting uh, here on my left, is uh, Mr. Laurent Lamotte, the um, previous uh, Prime Minister of Haiti, and now a co-founder of uh, GVG, a global voice group. Uh, Mr. Lamotte. Uh, sitting next to him is uh, Ludon Owen, uh, CEO of DLT Labs. And then you have uh, Professor Tim Brown, uh, professor at uh, Carnegie Mellon University in Africa. Then you have uh, Makoto Takemiya, uh, co-CEO of uh, Sorami2. And, uh, and then uh, Clement Wageneza, the CEO of uh, Rwanda Online. And finally, Stephen Rue, the managing partner of uh, Dragon Tree Capital. So to begin this uh, panel, we're going to invite uh, Mr. Laurent Lamotte to uh, have a few words, opening remarks. Uh, following which uh, we're going to uh, enter into the, con uh, the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Norbert, for the kind introduction. I'm very honored to be here today uh, in Rwanda. Rwanda is a very special place. It's at the forefront of digital development. So it's truly an honor and a pleasure to be here and participate at such a wonderful event. Today, the, the developing world is, is witnessing history. We're witnessing development at the core, where we have the possibility to leapfrog and to develop, to bring development to our people through the most powerful tools at our disposal today. Whether it be in Africa, whether it be in the Caribbean, the blockchain technology gives us the single best opportunity to bring this digital development to a reality. The single digital market that we're witnessing today is starting to bear its fruits. Today, we're going to see specific use cases, specific companies, what they're doing in the space. I was the prime minister of Haiti for three years after the earthquake that killed 250,000 people, injured 500,000 people, and most of all, that destroyed the country's economy. But what most people don't know, and why the blockchain is relevant to developing countries, is we had, in one single building, we had the entire records of the government in one building. Our tax records, our land titles, our voting registration was all in one single building. And in the 38 seconds that the earthquake lasted, that one building collapsed, taking with it the entire tax records, the entire election records, the entire land titles of the country. So on top of all the issues that we had having to deal with the grief of injured families, the grief of recovering um, children that were looking you know, as orphans, we had no tax revenues for, 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 for the first six months after the earthquake. And imagine the need of resources, tax revenues, none of it was coming back. So I decided to join that movement, this global movement, which is the, the, the blockchain movement, which is, a, which is gaining steam. I'm part of the Global Blockchain Business Council and do many talks around the world to talk about the power of the technology and how it has the, 
how it has the, the potential to change the world as we see it today. And we see an adoption from many sectors, many countries around the world. So today is an opportunity to change things, to talk from concept to actions. What is actually being done? Not in a conceptual way, but in real way. So I'm happy to be able to contribute to this panel today, and I want to thank you all for coming and listening to this very important and transformational technology, which is the blockchain technology. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Lamote, for those uh, wonderful remarks. Um, so after the earthquake, uh, nothing was left, and maybe if you had Bitcoin, uh, sorry, blockchain technology, things would be different. So for our panel, uh, I want to start with uh, right on your left, uh, Mr. Owen from DLT Labs. Um, I heard that you have a project ongoing right now in Congo, which is uh, to use uh, blockchain technology to trace uh, cobalt, which is not a renowned blood mineral or conflict mineral. Uh, can you tell us a bit more about how blockchain technology can be used uh, specifically for Africa's uh, resources uh, to make sure that uh, it is being used responsibly and, and all of that? Uh, thank you very much, Norbert. Uh, bienvenue tout le monde. Je vais parler en anglais. Uh, après, je pourrais expliquer en français si, uh, si vous en voulez. No, English um, is good. English is good, okay. Um, I am the uh, chair and the CEO of DLT Labs, and we're based in Canada with offices in uh, India, Japan, Singapore, and soon to be spreading out on a pan-African basis. We have a large team. It's not an advertisement. I'll keep it short. We have a very large team of distributed application developers. Um, we believe it's the largest independent team in the world. And what we found over the past few years is that people will adopt blockchain for two reasons. They need to or they want to. And on the need basis, we have clients coming to us constantly. They want to do something faster, better, cheaper, or more secure. So that's a very traditional purchase. On the want basis, people want to transform. They want to change. So specifically what happened is being a Canadian, we have a great deal of experience in the natural resource sector. And I think you're all probably very familiar with the issues that have arisen specifically in cobalt, but of course in other commodities. The hiring of child labor, which continues, irrespective of the processes that are in place. The OECD already has practices. They already have a database, they have multiple databases and silos. It simply continues. <laughs> So what happened is there's only one reason, which is need, that blockchain is being adopted in that sector and in other areas, whatever particular natural resource. It's because of consumers. So I've been going around the world and I've been holding up two telephones. One telephone, maybe I'll steal my neighbor's phone. One telephone, I say, listen, this telephone was ethically sourced. It cost an extra 50 cents or an extra dollar. This telephone was not. This other telephone was sourced unethically with child labor. Would you pay an extra 50 cents or an extra dollar for the phone that is ethically sourced? Would you actually sit in a meeting with these esteemed panelists and put your phone on the table with everybody in the room knowing it was not ethically sourced? So what's happened is the consumers are driving the adoption. So what we have done we partnered with a group called Cobalt Blockchain. They happen to also be Canadian-based. And we're taking the established mechanisms for tracking right from the mine all the way through to Apple or Daimler or Tesla to ensure that the process is transparent, secure, and actually works. So that's what, they're, that's what we have done. To us, it's a, it's a function of asset tracking so we have the asset tracking technologies in place, and we're demonstrating how powerful blockchain is in an enterprise solution. And very simply, what happened historically is the processes that were in place 
don't work. They can't function. And just to give a parallel example, in my own city, where we pay a great number of taxes, City of Toronto, we have restaurant licenses with 800 people inspecting restaurant licenses. Imagine, and 13 payment systems, by the way, imagine how many systems there are for tracking the traders, the people transporting, the individual artisanal mining operations. It's horrendous, and it's siloed, and these are individual expensive processes that don't function. So we're very optimistic that a blockchain enterprise solution will work not only in a cobalt environment, but across Pan-African and across the extractive industries. And one comment I have to make, last night I was asked about this by three students, uh, and you have this incredible African Leadership Academy. I think they should be sitting up here, not us. We're the old guard. I was absolutely astonished at the intellect, the insights, the energy and the passion from these young students. So it's great talking to us, but please talk to the students that are here because they've got tremendous capacities and they are the future. Well, thank you. Thank you for uh, those remarks, uh, uh, Mr. Owen. So if I understand correctly, the um, cobalt is uh, basically a low-hanging fruit. Is uh, maybe the one product which was uh, being utilized by uh, some companies with a lot of money, which was easy to get into. But this same technology can then be applied to basically everything. Absolutely. And we're being asked to track uh, fish on behalf of uh, some very large cruise shipping companies. We're being asked to track coffee. We're being asked to track anything you can imagine. Because once it's demonstrated, the rapid distribution of this technology, the rapid adoption, and what it can actually reflect, as long as the consumers care, companies will continue to do this. And this technology will provide a solution. So it may not be every single person that walks into a store in Sweden and that checks online to see on a transparent basis where the underlying ingredients came from what they're buying, but there are enough. Okay. That's a very good point, actually, to start our discussions today because uh, Transform Africa is about uh, this year. The theme is uh, the single digital uh, uh, African market. Uh, can you hear me? Okay, I'll try to speak louder. Uh, so uh, today I want us to focus on uh, CFTA, specifically eCFTA. So um, one of the uh, few, one of the countries, uh, some of the countries that did not sign the continental free trade area, namely Nigeria and South Africa, uh, did um, mention the uh, problem of uh, uh, re-exporting as one of the main reasons for them not to sign. They are afraid that countries will be importing products, packaging them, and then exporting them again to Nigeria, for example, which would um, be a big problem for them and their trade. Um, I want to ask, um, uh, how uh, do you see this uh, problem being solved uh, by uh, blockchain technology? How can blockchain technology actually have an impact on trade in Africa? I would like to uh, yes, to Stephen to, to answer that. Uh, thanks, Norman. Uh, my name is Stephen <coughs> Rue. I'm invested in, uh, we run a company called Dragon Tree Capital, and we're invested in different different sectors, uh, including mining, and I was intrigued by the comments uh, by my colleague over, over there. Um, I think one of the un unintended and perhaps not uh, discussed enough aspects of implementation of blockchain through supply chain technology, supply chains, is that it provides a level of transparency eventually that may, that may actually change the way the distribution of value is, is moved through the supply chain. So, so once you can actually, one of the key aspects of blockchain is obviously the ability to remove um, certain intermediary layers. So in, to your point, Norbert, uh, countries worried about the loss of value where they are no longer at, you know, getting recognition for value add can actually be, can gain from this process if they are genuinely investing in the development of products in their, or manufacturing in their country. Um, this is a huge benefit. Rwanda is a great example. It, it's a center for trade. It's a great, easy place to do business. Um, but it, it also means that like East Africa, Congo, or whether it be cobalt, tin, tantalum, or tungsten, any of these key area min, minerals and metals from the, the current region, where 
if you look at the phone example that was given, given just before, a phone that sells for $1,000, ask yourself how much of that money actually goes to the mine, to the person in the mine collecting the actual uh, underlying metal from the mine. It's not very much. And, and I think the exciting thing for me about hearing projects like that and ones that we're invested in ourselves is, is that blockchain provides the ability to have traceability through the system and have direct trackability back to from the buyer through the way through all the way down to the supplier and that means lower less middle people and more margin ultimately for the for the for the uh, you know manufacturer or or primary producers oh that's great um, so then it uh, really um, trade especially pan african trade depends on many things uh, for example uh, taxes or uh, customs uh, these are going through borders. Uh, Clement, wh what would you say, um, uh, you working for uh, uh, Irembo Randa Online, which is uh, give uh, government services to the people, do you see any benefits of blockchain technology for your industry and can that be done continentally? Uh, first of all, um, well, I, I, I personally have huge expectation on, on blockchain, but uh, I, and you know that uh, my friend Norbert, I don't, I don't completely disconnect um, like there is this blockchain technology and then the cryptocurrency. Uh, I think there is a whole um, that we need to consider when we start uh, talking about this. And uh, it starts with uh, building platforms. Um, what we've been doing at Randa Online is as an organization is to build a platform where government agencies are able to interact with citizens and uh, uh, provide them the, the basic government services, uh, a driving license and um, um, an ID, how do you apply for it and transact with government. But we, need to, we, we, we needed to come in as a platform so to organize all the ecosystem players for the, this value to be created. And the ecosystem players are many. It's, um, telcos that uh, uh, allow us to process payments um, with mobile money. It's uh, our network of agents that uh, interact with the citizens who don't have their own devices, so to allow them to interact with our, our portal. So um, when we try to, to, to build something or to evolve something, be it uh, in, in government services or uh, in trade, what we really want to do is, is build platforms. Um, now, the big expectation I have is, can blockchain and, of course, taken as a whole and the whole idea of tokenization, where a token represents value, uh, can it accelerate the way we build or we, build, we bring ecosystem together uh, so for that value to be created? And um, um, maybe an example, a specific example where I see this happening in, in our case is the way we deal with our network of agents. Uh, if we uh, look at our network of agents, there is a huge amount of friction between everyone involved. So uh, when our network of agents assist citizens, at the end we need to pay them for each citizen that they have assisted. But they do this across the month, and when the month ends, uh, we spend two weeks or three weeks trying to reconcile, know how, know how much uh, how many citizens each citizen have, uh, it's, it's, uh, each agent has, uh, has supported. Then we make a payment to them and we need to make a payment to them d through different channels. So by the time they get the money that uh, uh, represent the value of the service they've given to the citizen, there is huge amount of time that has uh, been spent there. So uh, that's the first friction. But then uh, there is another friction. Uh, which is citizen going to the agent, expect to get the service, but not being charged more uh, than the service because uh, they know that we are supposed to be paying these agents. But then sometimes agents will say, you know what, if you want this service, it's more complex for me to, to provide, so I will, you will have to add another 500 in top, on top of the real cost of the service. So these, all these are frictions. So, is there any possibility for us to combine blockchain and the tokenization so to make it more instant for everyone to, to have value with that, within that ecosystem without friction? So that's how I see 
blockchain transforming the way we do business. That's excellent. Um, so basically, the problem of corruption, which is uh, you touched upon uh, in the, your last words, is a big hindrance to integration in Africa. But it's also a big problem, a waste of resources in, uh, in all aspects. But I would really uh, like to uh, discuss a bit more about the building of platforms. And um, I know that, uh, Makoto, you have been uh, working in that area. Can you share with us uh, your insights? OK, so uh, my name is Makoto Takemiya. I, uh, I don't look Japanese, but I'm naturalized Japanese. So that's why I have this name. Um, I get asked that question quite a lot, actually. Um, so our company is a fintech company based in Tokyo, Japan. Uh, we have offices in a few countries, including Russia. One of my um, uh, employees gave a talk at the workshop on Monday, I guess. And uh, so we focus on, uh, well, two things, really. Um, identity and assets associated with that identity. So we are contri contributors to an open source project run by uh, the Lynx Foundation called Hyperledger. And uh, we created Hyperledger Iroha. It's one of the five, five DLT platforms in Hyperledger. And we use this platform to create uh, an identity system. And we're working on this right now. So if, without a digital identity, you can't have any digital economy. Um, and I think uh, many of the frictions that, uh, that people have in daily life can be solved by having a secure identity. Because then you can immediately find out um, what what attributes people have, what access they have, what rights. Uh, this can all be man uh, managed on a blockchain uh, platform using our identity system that we're trying to create. And uh, we want to extend this by uh, tracking different assets that people have uh, related to the identity. So for example, digital currencies. Um, we're working with the National Bank of Cambodia to build a central bank digital currency system. This is a retail and wholesale uh, settlement system. And the wholesale system should go live this year. It'll be the first uh, blockchain use uh, in production in the central bank in the world. Um, so we're, we're working very hard on that. Um, one of the interesting things about uh, the Cambodian case is that they have multiple currencies. Everyone uses real and they use dollar. So. Uh, the ability to support multiple assets on the same settlement system is actually quite uh, something that could be very useful, especially here in Africa. Um, I wanted to actually make the comment uh, in the last session, but um, in, uh, in the journal uh, Economic Geography this year, uh, Richard Werner, who's a famous economist, he wrote uh, an article, and they studied uh, the economy of Spain after Spain joined the EU. And um, the cool thing about uh, considering a, a united kind of African uh, digital economic zone is that the EU has been around for quite a while, and we can study it, and there's different econometric, econometric tests that can be done. And uh, they studied and they found that uh, there's actually no statistically significant relationship uh, or correlation between uh, joining uh, the European economic zone and adapting the euro and the GDP growth in uh, Spain. And uh, that was really quite interesting. Um, it makes you think a lot about, you know, what is the role of, uh, of, of value transfer in the different economies and, uh, you know, what, how much control should central banks have. Anyway, the point I wanted to make is that uh, if you have a digital economy uh, and you have a digital identity that allows people to participate in this economy, you don't have to have unified currency. You can have many different currencies. You can have many diff different assets. You can track cobalt, and that's probably... Uh, something that uh, DLT Labs is working on, I'm, I'm guessing. And uh, so uh, this is all about, you, you know, this infrastructure is nice, but how do you use it? And the most important way to use it is through automation, I think. One of the really cool things about currencies like Bitcoin is that you don't have to have trust in the system because you can't go against the rules of the system. Uh, so I think the previ previous panel, someone said code is law is, is BS. And th that's kind of true. Uh, but uh, what you can do is you can create mathematically provable um, uh, flows of value that can't, you know, you can't do something against it. So for example, if uh, paying taxes is required, you could take out taxes automatically in a settlement system that was based on a, on a blockchain solution. And uh, that way, no one could actually break the law because you're doing it automated. You're automating the, the rules of the society as much as possible. And you can't do everything, but you can do a lot. And if you can do that, you can get rid of a lot of problems with corruption, I'm guessing, as well. But um, it's, it's quite a complicated world, but you know, everyone is working on it and working on it, uh, creating it together. 
one of the previous panel speakers said that uh, he wants more competition in Africa. I think that's, that's the wrong way to look at it. You need more collaboration. You know, economies are, and so, so, human societies, you know, humans are natu uh, naturally uh, social animals. And you want people to work together and collaborate and to get a higher level of, higher level of fitness. So by working by yourself, you can only reach a small level of fitness, but if everyone works together and collaborates, you can reach a higher level that uh, you couldn't reach individually. And that's, uh, that's what this kind of infrastructure can help with. Yeah, uh, you're right. Uh, I think uh, we need both competition and collaboration. And I think uh, uh, one of the areas where we need to focus on in Africa is uh, actually in learning about blockchain. So um, we had really good uh, discussions today on the use of uh, blockchain and, the, and its potential. And I'm happy that on this panel, most of, uh, at least uh, four out of six, are implementing uh, blockchain projects in Africa um, and uh, putting all the efforts into it. But I think the most interesting and the uh, one who's been here the longest is uh, uh, Carnegie Mellon University and Tim. So Professor, I would like to hear uh, your thoughts on uh, how fast on or how well it's going in, uh, for Africa to adopt these blockchain technologies, how fast are we learning, and uh, how much more do we need, how much longer do we need in order to actually start um, fully utilize this technology in all its potential. And uh, please, uh, the other panelists are free to also jump in. Uh, they want it to be one way, yeah? Yeah, I'll say a few words on that. So uh, in terms of uh, are we ready for blockchain technology, um, I think uh, uh, people are coming to conferences like this. They're educating themselves. Uh, at Carnegie Mellon University, uh, Africa, our campus is here in uh, here in Kigali, actually just a few hundred meters from the uh, convention center. Um, and we've actually been teaching blockchain and cryptocurrencies for three years now. So we've been turning out students who understand the technology. Uh, how many uh, years? Three years. Okay. So, uh, so we've uh, uh, maybe jumped on that bandwagon early. Uh, but, we, but we've been trying to push out people who understand the technology. And our students are going out and they are working for uh, companies in, that are doing blockchain work in the, uh, in the conflict mineral space. They're uh, also working with uh, Rwanda Online. Uh, many uh, are, are working there as well. And so you know, we're doing our part to raise some of the capacity here. But uh, uh, the fact is the, there seems to be in Africa a, a blockchain or a Bitcoin or a cryptocurrency related conference uh, almost every month somewhere in Africa, right? And so I think a lot of people are very much attuned to it these days, and so I think that's coming. Now, uh, one of the caveats I want to have about blockchain technology, and it's actually the, sa <clears throat> the same story when we talk about IT in general. So many people uh, have looked at IT in the past, and they've said, oh, IT is going to, I IT is somehow going to uh, make my business better, and so on. Um, but the number one rule of IT is that IT doesn't create processes. IT is to facilitate existing real, poly, real poly, uh, processes that are already going on. In other words, you can have something that uh, tracks conflict minerals, but if you have no way to verify each of the steps, that on the ground uh, human uh, step of verifying, here's a truck going by full of uh, full of some material and investigating what's, what that material is, if you don't have that in place, there's no magic of IT that's going to somehow make that happen. And so, uh, so you need to think of blockchain not as a solution in and of itself. It's not, uh, um, we're not all Jedi here and just say we're going to solve the problem, you know, when we get to the, get, when we confront the problem, we don't just say blockchain. Right, and expect some, you know, suddenly, uh, you know, all the, the problem goes away, right? So, um, so we need to think of how blockchain fits into the larger, uh, pro the, the, the larger activity of developing processes and verifying them. And where I think the magic of black blockchain is, is that uh, before it was very uh, more difficult to to see where there were good processes and bad processes. But here, since we can document the processes in a way, in a in a way that uh, allows people to track them over time, to, to measure performance, uh, to, to see 
uh, when are we, when, what processes are working and not working, that gives the, the magic of the blockchain there is that it's going gonna, it's gonna to transform what were very opaque processes and turn them into open processes that allow us to improve upon them and shine a light on places that might have been very dark in the past. Okay. So, basically, uh, a lot of people are saying that the blockchain is uh, today is uh, similar to the internet in the early 90s where all you had to do is buy uh, a website uh, uh, www.dogfood.com and people will selling dog food online without any content, nothing. You just have the web domain, they will give you money. I, I see a bit of that uh, currently happening, but I think that um, that's one of the reasons why we are here is because we want people to get educated and to focus on the right things. So I want to uh, ask every single member of the panel here, there's a simple question, starting with you, Stephen. Uh, can you give me a definition of blockchain? I, I, just, I want to pick, pick you up on the first part of your question, the premise, which is okay. uh, you, can, you, know, you can open a blockchain company and get money easily. Look, it's like any investment. If, if, if an investor wants to give you money, you need to do as much due diligence on them as you, and the investor's gonna do due diligence on your project as well. So if it's a bad project, it's a bad project. It doesn't matter if it's blockchain or whatever. And I think that this, any, those people are gonna end up getting caught up, so all I can say is be responsible. The good actors will, will navigate through a very difficult, evolving regulatory environment uh, which hopefully, if all parties try and work together in a good code of conduct behaviour, then regulators won't be forced to make rash decisions and shut down things. It's, the responsibility is on investors and uh, operators or businesses or entrepreneurs alike to try and watch their peers, encourage their peers not to make silly investment propositions that then get uh, undermined and, and damage the, the, the sector and the industry. So. This is not a five-year race. This is not a one-year race. And I think that timeline needs to be understood and, and conveyed when thinking of these things. It will take time uh, for, for these types of uh, good versus bad to be distilled. Just still be responsible about the investment behavior and the, pro the investment propositions that are being put out. Fantastic. I think um, yeah, these technologies are obviously exciting, but you're right to point out that it's going to take some time to uh, fine-tune certain things. But you still didn't answer my question. <laughs> yeah. So, look, I think blockchain is, is a, a, a style of database type but relationship where trust is decentralized. There are different types of it. Let's not get caught up in blockchain itself. There yeah, are keep other, it simple. There are other types. There's Hyperledger and so forth as well. So the, the, the key thing is it's a way of managing trust where you don't need to trust in the system. Uh, the, the system has a set of rules that all parties need to validate or all nodes need to validate. Okay. Clément? Uh, I really don't know what blockchain is yet. <laughs> but I, I, there, there are some things that bother me is what it isn't. Uh, sometimes um, it, it can be depicted as uh, like all of a sudden because there is blockchain, then all of a sudden we are able to trace this thing or achieve this other thing. But uh, it's, what, I, what it isn't is, 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 is a solution uh, to a specific technical problem, in my opinion, because there are a number of ways we can still solve technical problems. Uh, we can still put uh, land registries on, uh, on a good database that is secure, that is distributed over the clouds and when there is an earthquake, they don't disappear. This is already feasible and has been feasible for years, right? Uh, so it's not a solution. There are many things we can still uh, achieve without the blockchain. Uh, but uh, rather how I see it is uh, uh, I really have this big expectation is that is the, the, the next big wave uh, of digital transformation, uh, the same way the Internet was. And this is uh, the, the promise that it can enable ecosystem to come together uh, without having some kind of a uh, Rwanda online organizing them uh, as a platform, or as a trusted platform. So that means today, we, when a citizen applies for a service on Irembo, 
they are sure we are, and, um, and my team are going to do the best so that they get this service. And if they, we don't, they know who to call. But can there be some way to accelerating this use cases by enabling people to actually come together, build an ecosystem, but where they don't need to have a trusted party in the middle of them. Um, this is the, the, the belief I, I have of blockchain. Okay. So technically, uh, blockchain is kind of the, the subclass and the parent is uh, distributed ledger technology. So distributed ledger technology is just the, the general class of technology and then blockchain is the, more of a data structure to group things into blocks. But what's more interesting to, to regular people is that um, it's a method for third party accounting. So uh, traditional accounting, accounting balance sheets were kind of done between two parties uh, to a contract and then uh, to audit those you actually have to look at the, uh, the two parties balance sheets and, and look at the, the system is the third party. So uh, the, the rules of the system and the fact that everyone can, can join the system and verify uh, the provenance of data in the system uh, creates kind of a, mm, I don't know, implicit third party uh, to, to all the transactions in the data. And this is interesting uh, because uh, it's harder to do fraud. Uh, you can do things like reducing counterparty risk uh, if you do things like automating uh, swaps of assets and things like that. So, um, so that the interesting thing that uh, when people mention blockchain, they're really referring to a method of uh, accounting where you're adding kind of a, a third party as a overseer, but that's not centralized but decentralized, so there can't be any corruption or fraud. That's a beautiful definition there. Thank you. Professor? So, uh, uh, a kind of data structure, right? And so it's uh, just a, a way of organizing data. but. But in this context, it has this cryptographic element to it. And so uh, for me, what blockchain is, is that it's, it's a mechanism for deciding where you put your trust. You can decide whether it's distributed, you can decide where it's centralized. But once you've decided where you've placed your trust, um, the blockchain becomes a mechanism of accountability for that person of trust or that, that who you've put the trust in. If you've decided that you've put it in a distributed way, your trust, you, can, you have a, a way of, a, of checking that whoever you've put your trust in, that they're adding blocks and they're doing things according to whatever mechanism or rules you, you would like them to follow. So uh, for me, it's not that important whether it's uh, you're putting trust in the government or you're putting trust in a distributed way. Um, it's more important that the blockchain allows, you to, uh, allows other people, the third parties, to uh, uh, observe what's happening and say, uh, when is somebody uh, doing things correctly and not correctly? Thank you. Yes, Ludo. Blockchain is a private jet, a collection of fast cars, a big house, and setting your family up financially for the next two centuries. That may not be the conventional answer to what is blockchain, but I will tell you how I became involved in the industry, which was I had a dozen interns working with me between the ages of 18 and 24, and they were on their telephones the whole time. And I was about to fire them because I thought they were texting their friends. They were actually all trading cryptocurrency. And I think we've had a lot of discussions about the technical dimensions here, but I don't think uh, we've really even touched upon what the transformative economic implications are from blockchain. So what blockchain is for me, I will tell you right now, as a unrepentant capitalist, that the estimate from the RBC, which happens to be a Canadian bank, Canadian banks are very conservative, is that in the next 15 years, there'll be an expenditure of $10 trillion on blockchain and blockchain-related technologies. In the next 15 years, there'll be an expenditure of $10 trillion on blockchain and blockchain-related technologies. That's half of the U.S. debt, aggregate national debt. So it's perhaps not the purely technical answer we're looking for, but what I see in the blockchain and what it reflects to me is many years ago, Moses was carrying the tablets around. And this is a, a biblical story. Some people believe it, some people don't. But there were these huge tablets. They talked about the tablets in the earlier discussion. These were different. much has changed. 
Data has been managed the same way, more or less, from the time of Moses. It's a little bit faster, it's a little bit smoother, but it's Moses and the tablets. This is the first change in the way data has been managed ever. This, and so I don't actually believe in blockchain. I believe in distributed data management powered by blockchain or powered by whatever means necessary. But I believe in the implications of the change in the way data is managed. Thank you. Mr. Lamote. So blockchain is many thanks to many people, as we can see on the panel, and, uh, and I experience this everywhere that I go. For me, uh, blockchain is, is a transformational technology that uh, is the new internet, if you want. Yesterday, the internet was an internet of information exchange, the information superhighway. Today, it's uh, the internet of transactions. It's a, it's, it, it's a database that's robust, that's decentralized, that, that builds trust, um, that's very difficult to hack. And, and outside of that, blockchain represents the rail on which dreams are built. Um, it represents the rails that takes the average person in this room that has a good idea and some of the craziest ideas as well and to raise financing fairly quickly based on strong concept paper and some not very strong and you have the ability to raise millions for an idea and some of the most outrageous ideas out there i, I was in a in a in a conference last month and i met this guy who had an idea to build a smart constitution so on the smart constitution, you know, he had a, a smart contract that basically the constitution would apply based on smart contracts. So I thought it was it was a crazy idea. But then but then he told me that you know he did an ICO and he already raised nine million dollars for the idea. So in in the conservative world, for him to raise nine million dollars for an idea like this would be very difficult at best. So it gives the average person the ability to change the world in a very short period of time. So not the blockchain itself, but it gives you the rails in order for, for those dreams to become reality. So, um, and this is why I think it's the, the ideal technology for a continent like Africa, because it allows leapfrogging to happen. It allows you to come from an idea and sometimes, you know, to bypass the traditional banking system to get, a fi to, to get financing for your platform through the, the mechanism of, of, a, of an ICU. So that's what blockchain is in my definition. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Stephen, you wanted to add something? Yeah, I, I just want to um, unpack this a bit further because I, I think we, we, there's all this blockchain, ICOs. These are just ways of getting funding and investment. And there's equities on one side, convertible notes, debt, all sorts of financing instruments. This is a new type of finance instrument. The difference is it doesn't affect your equity. So that's one thing. But bringing this back to the Continental Free Trade Agreement, which is part of, part of the topic of what we're here, um, here's a series of situations. Let me just paint it out for you, for at least how I see it as an outsider. And I say this as an outsider. Um, so I, I, from overseas, see 55, 54, 55 countries coming together a couple of months ago to sign a free trade agreement, which is probably once in my lifetime, I'm going to see something this significant, for each of the populations and the countries that have participated in this or are negotiating to the level of participation. What this is, is to, blockchain and the related distributed ledger style um, ways of managing your data create a situation where some way these countries that don't typically and haven't typically worked so efficiently together that they're somehow magically going to be efficient un under this new regime of a free trade agreement can technically start to work together. That's what's important. That's yes. what's significant. It's the fact that individuals will own their own data. It's the fact that certifications of 
whether it's their citizenship or whether it's their certification from a university uh, or it's their health data. They, can, they, they or you or people in these different communities can exchange this data or lease this data and participate in the different sharing of, of these key pieces that can be certified now through a technology system that is not overall new but is, is now becoming pervasive. And if it is pervasive across the, the continent, then, then the leapfrogging can occur. It is exciting, there is a lot of money around, but still fundamentally the major change that an outsider like me sees, even though we've been in the country of Rwanda and other countries for nearly 15 years, I'm still an outsider, is that populations can work together in a trusted way where typically they haven't been able to, and now there is a free trade agreement that encourages you to do so. It's so exciting, but it's the data ownership that's exciting. <clears throat> Thank you for that. Uh, indeed, it's uh, very exciting. Clement, you want it quickly? Yeah, quickly something? building on the uh, free trade area. I mean, um, isn't the question is, isn't blockchain even go able to allow people who wanted to trade with, between each other to do so without waiting for 54 countries to sign any agreement at all? Yeah, of course. Uh, the, the, the idea is not that uh, the, the free trade area is going to happen because of blockchain. But what he's saying is that uh, up to today, there's not um, that much solution, for example, for identity, for diplomas, that can be in a decentralized manner. Because imagine how long it's going to take to build a Pan-African uh, centralized repository of diplomas, or how complex that's going to be. But if you can build a blockchain uh, uh, powered platform, on, then it's uh, actually not, uh, not that difficult. Can I just respond to Clement? Quickly. I mean, look, it's, a, it's a great point. It, it, technically, yes. But that's, the free trade agreement is not about technology alone. It's about regulation, tax, and so forth. So even if technically we can do a lot of things, the free trade agreement is a way of now minimizing trade tariffs so that people can trade together in a regulated way. So we can't, we can't forget regulation in the, in the, in the scheme of things, and, and that's why it's important. But it's a, it's a fair, fair point. It does allow that interconnectivity. It's the fact that the free trade agreement now allows it to happen in a, in a more uh, tariff-free or um, uh, continent-wide based economy. Okay, so uh, now we're going to reach out to the public. If you have uh, any questions, please uh, raise your hand. Microphone. Let's start here in the front row and then go back. Je vais parler en français parce que je viens d'un pays francophone. Pour me faire bien comprendre, euh, alors, j'ai des contributions et des questions. Euh, je vous remercie déjà le panel qui est là. Je suis venu spécialement pour vraiment écouter les spécialistes. Mais plus je les écoute, <rire> je me rends compte que euh, je ne comprends rien au Bitcoin, au Bitcoin et tout ce que vous voulez, au blockchain. J'ai lu des bouquins, bon, mais je dis, ma question est celle-ci, est-ce que nous, Africains, nous devons nous intéresser à cette technologie Et d'après ma compréhension, le Bitcoin, le Bitcoin c'est en quelque sorte le logiciel et le blockchain donc la quincaillerie, le matériel. Donc, dans le bitcoin, il y a plusieurs types de bitcoin, d'après ce que j'ai entendu, il y a plusieurs marques ou des choses comme ça. Et le bitchain, c'est unique, c'est comme le cloud. Est-ce que c'est ça Et qu'est-ce que nous devons nous attendre de ça, nous, Africains Devons-nous nous intéresser à ça, oui ou non Et comment nous intéresser à ça pour résoudre un certain nombre de problèmes Voilà. Okay. Merci. Je vous remercie. Uh, somebody want to tackle this one? Uh, Professor? Sur la question. Uh, okay, to... Go ahead. Sur la question de si ça devrait nous intéresser, je, je crois que nous sommes au point où on n'a pas le choix. I think we have no choice, and we it's it's 
it has already spread and it's going so fast and it's, uh, we, we, we no longer have a choice than to accept it. Actually, what I believe in is that we should uh, try to adopt it as fast as possible. I think when we have this specialist here at Transform Africa, I mean, many people who were at the beginning of this whole idea 10 years ago would love to have had people who were at the beginning of the idea of the internet 10 years after it had started telling us what it could become and us leveraging go needs as fast as possible because we still have this age which is us not having too many legacy systems that prevent us to, to adopt more easily something that's, uh, that's novel. So I think actually beyond being interested, I think we should, uh, as African, look at it as, uh, as, our, way not, as our way to lead the digital uh, revolution uh, because we can adopt it much faster based on, on the opportunity of no legacy systems. Uh, à mon avis, vous avez très quickly, bien quickly. compris les questions qui sont au centre de Bitcoin et blockchain et tout ça. Le blockchain, c'est tout simplement une plateforme. On peut l'utiliser pour accélérer, pour avoir plus de sécurité et pour développer n'importe quoi. Il y a des, uh, des domaines où c'est très important, autres autre fois non. Mais ce qui est important et ce que la question est très compliquée parce que c'est un mélange de la politique, de la technologie et des questions sociales. Et à mon avis, exactement ce que mon collègue euh, juste vient de dire, c'est très important d'être euh, à l'avant au lieu d'être derrière. Parce que c'est la première fois que j'ai vu dans ma vie qu'en Afrique, vous pourriez tout simplement soit des leaders, soit à l'avance. Et quand il y a des conférences partout au monde, moi, ça fait trois semaines que je n'ai pas rentré chez moi. Je dois le faire bientôt parce que j'ai plus de chemise. Mais euh, ce que j'ai remarqué, que c'est très différent ici qu'au Japon, au Singapour, au Dubaï. C'est très différent ici. Il y a des in intérêts qui sont plus sociaux. Il y a des gens qui sont vraiment motivés. Autre part, c'est une question de l'économie, du commerce. Ici, il y a une passion pour l'Afrique entière. Comment travailler ensemble et tout simplement, moi je pense, à mon avis, que ça c'est une technologie qui peut accélérer, faciliter l'expansion de l'Afrique et la collaboration. Merci. Euh, micro Oui, vas-y. Bonjour, je m'appelle Rafiki Jorma, je suis Congolais de la République démocratique du Congo. Je travaille aussi dans le numérique, je représente une entreprise qui fournit le e-banking. Alors ma question va directement s'adresser à un monsieur qui vient d'intervenir, parce qu'il a parlé de cobalt. Alors, moi je pense que l'objectif de, de toutes les évolutions et du développement devrait d'abord profiter à la population locale. Alors, en parlant du secteur de cobalt, le problème du cobalt congolais qui vient directement de mon pays, c'est que plus de la majorité, vraiment plus de 50% se vend illégalement. Et le problème c'est la corruption. Alors ma question est celle-ci. Est-ce que l'opération que vous avez faite avec votre entreprise canadienne, elle permet au moins de diminuer les coûts de, de la corruption Est-ce que l'État congolais a montré cette volonté-là de vouloir aider et changer la vie de la population locale où se trouvent les mines Parce que la population locale, en majorité, n'en profite pas. Alors ma question est simple. Est-ce que votre opération permet au moins d'améliorer la vie de cette population locale qu'avant votre arrivée Est-ce qu'elle permet-il de, de rendre les choses un peu claires et réduire la corruption Merci beaucoup. Très bien, question. Et je vais. Euh, nous donne, il faut être un peu rapide avec les réponses. Try to be faster with the answers. OK. Oui et non. <laughs> Ça, c'est la réponse. Uh, I, I'll explain in English, asking about the corruption Next. and the amount of mining that comes from illegal sources where you can't track it. And there is no magic, as we have a sources. If you have tamper-proof tracking, it's not perfect, but it depends on one thing, the customer. It's all about the customer. If the end customers, whether it's the smelter, whether it's the brand, and they care enough about their brand or the consumer that purchases, they will oblige companies to use 
sources of cobalt or any other commodity that are not illegal, that are not uh, uh, laden in corruption. Donc ça vient des, des, de, de l'origine du problème, c'est d'avoir des, à mon avis, uh, tous les consommateurs qui, qui forcent la question. Et puis, today you have a merging of the brand and the supply chain. They're locked together. And that's where blockchain is going to make a big difference. If you can't prove to me that the, this telephone I just bought is with cobalt that's ethically produced, I'm not going to buy it. And that will force people down the chain to make sure from origin it's in tamper-proof containers and tamper-proof all the way along. It's not perfect, but it's the best solution I have seen. Okay, Stephen, you want to add something quickly? Yeah, I just want to add something on the mining point. Um, uh, just raise your hands if you want to ask questions so I'll I can you see you. Okay. 15 second description of how it works. So at the moment, DRC sells its cobalt out, but places like Rwanda, Burundi, others are subject to, whether it be tin or tantalum, they get bags get tagged from the mine. From the mine, these are governed through an NGO, which is not Rwandan, right? So a third party outside of Africa is deeming whether Africa's countries are responsible or not. That's just not right. So what blockchain allows is for Africa to manage its regulation, for Africa to say whether it's responsible and its supply chain solid or not. That's, this is the power of what's happening. At the moment, Yttria, all, which, you know, this is not a comment about whether they're good or bad organisations. They are just organisations trying to run a supply chain that doesn't have a secure mechanism to protect the supply chain for the consumer to the point of selling it responsibly so someone in another country can feel happy or, or sad or responsible. That's a very noble cause and I support it. But the real, real power of this is about Africa. It helps Africa police itself. It doesn't need a third party to tell it. That's, that's the point I want to thank make. Thank you, on the thank mind. you, Stephen. That's a very important point. Okay. Go ahead. My name is Linda from Kenya. Um, I just wanted to bring in a case use from Kenya that we, we have tried. The government of Kenya digitized the land records and they use blockchain as a technology to drive that. There were issues. Uh, traditionally, people will come to lawyers like ourselves and say, I want to buy a piece of land. They would do a search, a physical search. The files were in one room. So the government came in and said, you know what, we'll digitize this and use the blockchain technology. So the law society, which I belong to, uh, resisted these moves and said that the regulations are not in place to have blockchain within the, uh, within the country. So our concern was about trust because corruption would thrive, and I don't think blockchain will solve the issue of corruption. For instance, you talked about um, distributed ledger. Sorry, I can't remember your name. But when you talk about distributed ledger, it just means that the genesis block in that particular blockchain, if it is wrong, it means therefore that the entire block would be wrong, right? So for instance, if this land is not my own, but there are two titles to it, giving, uh, putting my title, which maybe will be a fake title, on that particular blockchain and saying this belongs to me, eventually it is not correct. So the African problem of corruption, I believe, may not be solved using blockchain. Um, and our governments, I think, know this. I want to be sure that from my apartment in Nairobi, I'm able to buy a piece of land in Accra online and say that as an African, I can be able to trade on blockchain across Africa. Secondly, um, Kenya has employed, I think, Twiga Foods in our country um, have, they used to supply, it's a supply chain company that supplies groceries to traders, small traders who are called mamambogas. So Twiga has done this for a while and what they did was to score these trade, small scale tra traders on, uh, on uh, blockchain and they're able to give them an identity and say, this is how much you could borrow. So they're working together with IBM and I think uh, these are some case uses that countries would look at and say, how do we use this in our own countries and say, banks are not scoring um, small scale tra traders, they're not able to access credit, but we have now Twigger Foods giving these small scale, scale traders um, opportunities to access credit. Opportunities in Africa in this case, as we talk about digital markets, I believe it will come up with um, companies that will come in, like blockchain companies that will offer solutions and say, for instance, can we get uh, identities across Africa? I want to know, I want to know who was my grandfather. Is that available? Who can bring this and say, within Africa, I can actually trace my route through South Sudan and pay for it. I'll be able to pay for an ancestry 
um, tree online and things like that. So I think as we talk about blockchain, a lot of us are sort of ambiguous and it doesn't make sense to us. But when we come down to a small scale trader accessing credit, then it makes sense. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next question. Okay. Oh, wait, wait. I want to see uh, all the people who have questions. So we have one, two, three, four, five. Okay. That's it. Five people. No more. Thank you. I am Darryl. Go ahead. Hello. Daryl Collins from India. My question is, which professions do you think that blockchain will make extinct? Which profession? Blockchain will make extinct. Okay. Thank you. You don't have uh, the professions anymore. Can somebody note that? We're going to answer them at the end. So, professor, maybe? Or, okay. Next question. Hello. Hi. Yes, go ahead. Hello, hello. Uh, I'm Robert Ngalova from Tanzania. Uh, I'm looking at this blockchain technology as a booming thing that, like, everyone would, would want to have. Taking my experience in implementing digital solution in development projects, uh, is there any a framework, like enterprise framework, that will guide countries to deploy a blockchain technology based on the issue that they're trying to solve? To be specific, if the panel members can answer, citing how the digital identities and the vital statistics and records uh, solutions can be implemented using the blockchain technologies. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, who's volunteering for that? I think Ludon can answer that. Next question. Uh, yes, my name is Edgar. Uh, I work in the logistics industry. Uh, one of the problems we face is one of um, transactional bottlenecks. So, bottlenecks across the transaction chain. So, paperwork uh, that gets lost oftentimes leads to slow payments and we're wondering how can we leverage the blockchain systems with hyperledgers uh, to streamline payments uh, without using digital currencies like Bitcoin where we can actually use dollars, francs, etc. without coordination from banks and regulatory agencies because one of the issues we have right now is with let's say a regulatory agency that would not uh, be able to authenticate uh, a blockchain ledger and uh, so issues like that for instance how can we jump that to, to streamline logistics okay thank you uh, no there's somebody who's yeah hello uh, thank you so much um, my name is Peter Kato from Uganda uh, my question goes to um, about uh, blockchain for payment when I look at Bitcoin and Ethereum and other cryptocurrencies uh, that deal, uh, that have uh, blockchain technology, I don't really think uh, blockchain could be a solution for the payment globally. When I look at uh, blockchain, uh, the best blockchain cryptocurrency can have about like 3,000 3, uh, transactions per second. And uh, having this system that we've been having, and the reason why uh, cryptocurrency was introduced, I think uh, blockchain, uh, best cryptocurrencies were introduced to replace the fiat currency. When I look at the Visa system, that can have about like 56 transactions per second. I don't really think a blockchain could be a solution for that. I think we could be having a better uh, technology than Bitcoin. I mean, than blockchain. Thank you so much. Okay. So maybe we can try to answer these uh, first five questions. I think uh, starting with the lady from Kenya. Um, who wants to go for that? Yeah. Uh, so that was a, that's an excellent uh, use. Uh, land registry of uh, using blockchain. Uh, it's exactly this point I was making earlier. It's who do you put your trust in? So uh, pretty clearly the, the, the government of uh, Kenya is the ultimate uh, 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 Guarantor of who owns what land, uh, as they have the uh, they have the power to uh, to sequester land. They have uh, many different powers. So, so in that case, you might not have a distributed uh, a 
distributed blockchain in the sense that you wouldn't have many, many people who are verifying these transactions. You might, in fact, put your trust in the, a, a particular uh, government agency for guaranteeing the, the, that somebody has purchased a land and now the, the ownership has ceased to be you and it's now somebody else. So, um, but that doesn't uh, prevent in and of itself corruption. Uh, it doesn't pre prevent, uh, you know, some MP from deciding that uh, all this land should be taken from these people so that they can build a new mall. Uh, it doesn't uh, uh, present, uh, prevent any of that from happening. But nevertheless, it's in a public ledger that everybody can see that that's happened, right? And so now it shines a light on that activity, and it, and it puts it in a form where uh, people can uh, have more recourse to say, look, there's a problem here, and they can say, look, this is what happened, and they can verify it, not that there was some record, and then, oh, we lost those records, I don't know what you're talking about, uh, I don't recall you ever owning that land, and so on. So I think it, in that sense, it, it, doesn't, it can't stop uh, a, the person you, uh, so there's, uh, there's who you put your trust, and then there's a separate question of whether they're actually trustworthy, right? Okay. But at least you've decided where you put your trust, and maybe by, for legal reasons you have to put your trust in them. But it also maybe over time have a have a, have a mechanism for uh, giving feedback or protest over what's happened. Okay, thank you, Professor. Could you quickly answer the jobs also? We're closing. Well, no Which job jobs ever, will disappear. No job is ever extinct, right? We still have people. Uh, you know, making candles from by hand because they think that's a, they think that's interesting, right? Uh, okay. And uh, and so, uh, but nevertheless, uh, uh, I I think uh, uh, it it does have a it does have a potential of uh, making government employees less needed uh, in terms of uh, because the government for now is often the the agency that's uh, that's uh, verifying transactions and. And so on, and as as you can speak more to, you know, Arembo is trying to make as much of this online as possible. Now, I've since I live in Rwanda and I use Arembo myself, uh, I see how how it's evolved over time. In the beginning, Arembo was uh, the, a process that allowed me to to pay for things and essentially request that some uh, transaction would take place. But in the end, I had to go to the sector office or the local. Uh, district office and do everything by hand because uh, the, the process was not completely encoded from end to end. But I see over time it's becoming more and more encoded electronically and I see the, that uh, you know, a lot of people will have less and less to do in these government offices. Okay, thank you. So we are already running late um, on the question of uh, firmware. Somebody asked if there is a firmware that can be used. I think that uh, you can approach any of the I think two or three of these uh, panelists uh, who can uh, help you with that. I think uh, DLT, uh, 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 Owen over there is a company specializes in that. Uh, in terms of transaction without uh, using Bitcoin and, and other cryptocurrencies, that is uh, uh, the subject of the first panel today. Uh, there are many ways to tokenize value. And uh, so in closing, I want to also give my own personal interpretation of uh, blockchain which uh, I think is not there yet, but which will, will ultimately be, which is the internet of value, so that uh, the way we have the internet of information and the way that information has revolutionized, uh, the internet has revolutionized the way that information circulates, it will be the same way in a few years.